And I, of course, he was obviously referring to verse 15 of chapter 15 uh, here. I don't call you servants, but friends. And I said, well, I realize you're talking about John 15, where Jesus said that, but you might notice in verse 14, he says, you are my friends if you do everything I command you. So it's true, we are his friends, but not like ordinary friends. My ordinary friends don't have to do everything I command them. We have a, more of an egalitarian relationship. If someone has to do everything I command them, they're, they may be my friend, but they're my servant, too. And when Jesus said, I don't call you servants, but friends, this is one of those cases of what I've referred to as a limited negative. I don't call you only servants, but also friends. Sure, you're still going to be my servants, but you are servants that, I, that your master has brought you into a friendship with him. He's, he's treating you like friends now. Most servants don't expect that, but my servants, I treat them as my friends. It's interesting that after Jesus made this statement, that I don't call you servants, yet every one of the writers of the epistles refer to themselves as servants of Jesus Christ. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Peter, a servant of Jesus Christ. They are servants. James, a servant of Jesus Christ. Even though Jesus said, I don't call you servants. I call you friends. Well, they said, well, we call ourselves servants. <laughs> and you can befriend us if you want to, Jesus, but we're still serving you. Because that's our real role. You're the Lord. You're the Lord, we're the servants. Now, if the Lord wants to be friendly with his servants, if he wants to take his servants into his confidence as a man takes his friends into his confidence, that's the master's prerogative, and it's a great privilege to be his servant because he calls us not only servants, but also friends, but not less servants. And so he says, I don't call you servants, for a servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends for all things I have heard from my father I have made known to you. In other words, I'm not keeping a secret from you. A man doesn't confide in his slaves, of his household, all of his plans. He tells his friends those things. He doesn't tell his servants. They're not, they're not in, included in that, that privileged circle of confidence. But he says, I brought you into my confidence. Now, it does say, he does say here, everything I've heard from my father I've, I have uh, made known to you. But that's not quite correct because he tells them in the next chapter... There are things yet I want to tell you, but you're not able to bear them. But this is not really a contradiction. Basically, what he's saying is, as of my attitude toward you is to disclose to you everything that the Father has shown me. I've got no secrets from you. However, I haven't told you everything yet, because you can't receive it yet. That's what he says in chapter 16, verses 12 and 13. You, you can't yet receive it. It's, it's not the, the uh, limitation is not on the side of my willingness to share with you. It's on the side of your ability to receive it. So I'll have to share that with you through the Spirit after I'm gone. The Spirit will lead you into all the truth that I have not been able to tell you because you can't yet receive it. Nonetheless, I've held back nothing that I could teach you that you could receive it up to this point is how we have to understand that last line of verse 15. Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. He's still on this subject of fruit. And that your fruit should remain, that whatever you may ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Now, of course, we're coming back to repeat information, but here's something new. I, you have not chosen me, but I chose you. Again, a very uh, popular proof text for the Calvinist view that election, that is God's choosing, is uh, unilateral, from God's side. That God does the choosing and we don't. In fact, uh, if, if one is a true Calvinist, they believe that we couldn't because we can't make any choices uh, in the direction of believing or repenting or anything like that toward God because we're dead in sins before we're regenerated. And so God has to do all the choosing. And so he says, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And yet they did, too, choose him. They did make choices. Again, this is no doubt another limited negative. <clears throat> you did not only choose me, but I also chose you. Or even maybe primarily and more importantly, I chose you. He's not saying they didn't choose him because they clearly did. Even in the Old Testament, people made choices. Joshua said, choose you this day whom you'll serve. You choose. Choices are the prerogative of persons who have will. Animals don't really make choices at the same level humans do, but humans do make choices about their 
their moral uh, uh, direction and their destiny. This is the dignity of being made in God's image. This is the dignity of being human rather than animal. We do make choices, and the disciples did make a choice, but they didn't make it in a vacuum. He chose them, too. I mean, he walked up and said, follow me. They didn't come running to him and say, let us follow you. He said, follow me. Then they made their choice. Will they do it? Will they not? He's not saying that I did all the choosing and you did none of it. He's simply saying that you may remember choosing to follow me. Well, that's not all that was going on. More significantly, I chose you. You didn't just choose me. I chose you as well. And that's the more significant aspect. Now, chose them for what? This is not a reference to election for salvation. He chose them to be who, in the role they were in. He selected them from among a larger group of people. Some of the people, as far as we know, had come to Christ without him specifically calling them. When Jesus was doing his ministry publicly, he had a general invitation out to whoever you know, is uh, burdened and heavy laden uh, and weary, let him come to me and take my yoke upon you. There was a general invitation to everybody to be a disciple if they would. And many even just came to him without him personally asking them and said, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. There were a lot of people in Christ's entourage, disciples, that followed him around, at least 70 we know of. Because on one occasion he sent 70 of them out on an outreach. He had a large number of disciples. But the scripture says that on a certain night, Jesus spent the whole night in prayer. And then when he was done praying, he called his disciples to him. And from them, he chose 12. And he called them apostles. So there was a larger group of people who had been following Jesus, who were disciples. And among them, and from among them, he selected 12 to be apostles. These are them. So when he says, I chose you, in all likelihood, he's not just even referring to the question of the, uh, you know, the secret decree of God as to who would be saved and who would not be saved. But rather, I have selected you from among a larger group of disciples to have a special role as my apostles. In all likelihood, this choosing he's referring to is a vocational choosing, a choosing to the vocation of apostleship rather than a reference to uh, a choosing them to have faith or choosing them to be born again or choosing them to uh, become Christians. Now, of course, if Calvinism is true, then this verse can be understood in that way. But if Calvinism is not uh, generally supported from the rest of Scripture, then there's no reason to import a Calvinist, specifically Calvinistic uh, interpretation into this passage. Many believe, and I think it's likely, that he's talking about choosing them as apostles, not choosing them for salvation. There were many people who were saved who were not apostles. Only a small number from those who were saved were chosen to the role of apostleship, and these were among them. And Jesus made that choice of them. But they also had made a choice to follow him at a certain point. But in that case, he says, at the end of verse 16, uh, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may, do, he may give you. Remember when he said that same thing in verse 7. I mentioned that that somehow is connected to fruit bearing. Because it's in the context of verses 1 through 8 that he's talking about fruit bearing. And verse 7 is in the midst of that. He's still talking about fruit bearing in verse 8. When he says, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you'll be my disciples. But prior to that, he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, which, by the way, a couple of verses earlier is the condition for bearing fruit, abiding in him. He says, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done to you. So it sounds like in the context of bearing fruit, there's this, this uh, carte blanche, as it were, to uh, sign Christ's name to any check, uh, to make any request in his name, which of course has be, got to be understood in the, in the context. He's not, he's not commissioning these disciples to go out and get themselves Cadillacs and uh, Mercedes and mansions and, and yachts uh, by just signing checks with Jesus' name on it. To act in his name means you're acting as his agent. And therefore, you're doing for him 
you're acting in his name, the things that he would do. And so certainly one of the things that he must be thinking and praying for is for fruitfulness. I pray that I would have more of the love of Christ, more of the peace of God, more of the joy. That is this fruit that he says I'm supposed to be having. I'm asking that in Jesus' name, and that certainly is something he approves of. And so it would appear that asking for anything, the assumption is what you're asking for, is, uh, is for, for spiritual fruit in your life, for the fullness of the Spirit in your life, primarily. That seems to be the main thing. In Luke chapter uh, 11, as I recall, let's see if I'm right about this. Luke 11, 11. Jesus said, if a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? And if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give earthly riches to those who ask him? No, that's not what it says. That's not what it says. Good gifts, isn't that what good gifts are? Chauncey says his Bible actually says that. <laughs> that's, that's what you'll hear in the black Pentecostal churches and, and the white Pentecostal churches too. That's right. I, I mean, all the Pentecostal churches. And they'll talk about how, you know, the, the, the gift of, uh, that the good things that God wants to give you through prayer are the, the good life, you know, the, the Cadillacs and the, or maybe it's not Cadillacs anymore. It used to be Cadillacs a generation ago. Now it's probably Mercedes or something else. But, um, the point is that Jesus says, earthly fathers give good gifts to their children who ask them, so certainly God will give good gifts to those who ask him. Well, yeah, true, but what are those good gifts? Notice what Jesus said. He didn't say the father will give earthly riches. He says, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This carte blanche that the father gives to his children to pray and ask whatever they will obviously are related to the spiritual gifts, the fullness of the spirit, the spiritual manifestations in one's life. So this praying in Jesus' name and asking whatever you will, he's assuming that you are my disciples and what you will is to be Christ-like. What you will is to have more love, more power, more of you in my life. That's the, the prayer that he assumes we're asking. And he also brings it up in this point in John 15, uh, 16. He says that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. So I'm not saying that the prayer can only be for spiritual things. Certainly we can pray for our daily bread as well. Jesus authorized us to pray for that and even told us to pray for that. You can pray for material things that you need, but this idea you can ask anything you want to is in the context of wanting to bear fruit, to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Now, verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet, because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you, Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. So he's telling the disciples that you're going to have God on your side, but you're going to have the world against you. Because if you're like Jesus, the world's going to treat you the way that they treated Jesus. He says, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. If they listened to me, they'll listen to you. You are going to be just like me. And as such, the world will have the same reaction to you that they have to me. Now, this is as it should be. Because the things that cause people to hate Jesus, the things in him that they don't like, should be things they see in us too. And if they don't like those things, they shouldn't like it in us any more than in him. And yet many times, we, we are very careful to, to try to make sure that people who hate Jesus will like us. And it's hard to know whether that's possible. 
if we're like him. If we are living as he lived, speaking as he spoke, uh, representing, bringing the light to people who hate light and who love darkness, uh, this we should expect to have a result of them reacting to us as, as to Jesus. Now, not everyone who's not a disciple hates Jesus. The world that he speaks about is that part of humanity that is following Satan, specifically. They are the, what Paul referred to in Ephesians 2 as the children of disobedience. There are people who are committed to rebellion against God, who have the devilish spirit animating them. True, many Christians believe that anyone who's not following Jesus is actively following the devil. I'm not positive that that is taught in Scripture. The Bible certainly does say there are children of the devil and there are children of God. Uh, and the children of the devil are murderous. The children of, God, of the devil want to do what the devil wants to do. He wants to murder and kill and destroy. And uh, not every non-Christian I've met seems to have any interest in killing and murdering and destroying. I mean, I don't know that every non-Christian is quite so devilish. Now, every non-Christian is blinded by the devil. Every non-Christian is uh, failing to see the truth because they're listening to the devil's lies. There's no question that the devil has his impact on everyone who is not a Christian. But not everyone is an avid follower of, of their father, the devil. So that if, I mean, when Jesus was on earth, there were people who were his disciples, and there were people who tried to kill him. And there were others who were neither disciples nor interested in killing him, right? I mean, not all the people in Galilee rose up together to try to kill Jesus. There were some who did, and some of them had to be stirred up to do so. They had to be stirred up by the Pharisees and others to do so. But there were a lot of people who were not disciples of Jesus who weren't just plotting to kill him either. They were ordinary peasant people who were just trying to mind their own business, and they were interested in what Jesus had to say, and maybe they got disinterested when they couldn't understand what he was saying, and they went their way and forgot about him. But not everybody hates Jesus, and therefore not everybody is supposed to hate you. You don't have to make people hate you. You don't have to feel badly if someone who's a non-Christian finds you to be a pleasant person and, and likes, is drawn to you. They may not be part of that world that's, that hates Jesus. They may be people that are being drawn to Jesus. They may be people that the Holy Spirit is working upon. After all, before a person becomes a Christian, they do have to be a non-Christian. Uh, and from being a non-Christian to being a Christian, there's usually a process. It's not very often the case, although it may be the case in many, that a person is totally a non-Christian. They hear the gospel, they become totally a Christian. In many cases, people are being drawn through a series of dealings of God in their lives and exposure at different levels to the light and responding to different, at different stages like until they finally understand and receive the gospel and become full disciples of Jesus. It's, it's, it's very popular in Christian theology just to polarize everyone into two polar opposite groups. You've got the people who love God with all their heart, they're the elect. You've got the people who hate God with all their heart, they're the non-elect. But, but is that really what you find in the real world? I don't. And nor does the Bible insist that we must look for that in the real world as though that's necessarily the case. There are people who love God with all their heart. There's people who hate God with all their heart. And there's a whole bunch of other people who are kind of in the middle, you know, kind of not sure what they think. Still confused, still looking, still searching, just wrapped up in their own problems and their own pains and their own crises and so forth. And not, they don't hate God and they don't love God. They're just not even thinking about God. He's not in their thoughts. And so in that sense, we could say they're enemies of God because you said whoever's not for me is against me. Uh, but they're not enemies consciously. They're, in their own mind, they're not thinking, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm hating God. I sure hate that God up there. Uh, they may be people who are at, at odds with God because they haven't surrendered to him. But they don't necessarily hate him. And when Jesus was on earth, such people didn't necessarily hate him. And they won't necessarily hate you. I say all of that because you might start to feel bad if some of your non-Christian friends actually like you. You know, oh, I don't know if they should like me. Maybe I should be a little more offensive. So they won't like me because they, they don't love Jesus. They shouldn't love me. Well... There are people who may be in the process of being drawn to Jesus. They may not even know that's the case, but God does. He's drawing them to him through 
you adorning the gospel in your life, that you are an attractive person to them because you're a loving person and because you're a good person. Some people like those things. That's just it. I mean, I, I can't go along with the, do, the doctrine of total depravity that says that everyone who's not born again, everyone who's not regenerate, just hates goodness. Does the world hate Mother Teresa? Most, most of the world admires Mother Teresa. Not because she's a babe, but because she's godly. Of course, she's gone now. But the point is, I mean, if she was uh, Princess Diana, you wouldn't know for sure. Do they love her because of her good deeds or because she looks like a, a model, you know? But Mother Teresa, people love Mother Teresa for what? Just because she's good. Even non-Christians admire Mother Teresa because she was good. You know, this idea that all people who aren't Christians are just lovers of evil and haters of good, I mean, that's a, that fits nicely into doctrinal pigeonholes in certain systematic theology. It doesn't fit into the real world. That's not the way it is. And so the world that hates Jesus, those who hate Jesus, will and should hate you. And if you find people who, are, who, are, who hate Jesus, and everything they speak about him is venomous and hostile, and yet they think you're okay, then you should be concerned. Because they don't see much of Jesus in you, apparently. Not enough of him to hate you like they hate him. And frankly, you know, to be hated by those who hate Christ because they see too much of Christ in you, that kind of insult is flattering. When the disciples were beaten for their testimony in the book of Acts, it says they left the presence of the council, the men who had beaten them, it says they left rejoicing to be counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Christ. It was a, it was a compliment to them. The people who had killed Christ were also wanting to kill them. The people who had had Christ flogged had flogged them. And so they considered that that was a privilege. You'll see this in uh, it's Acts chapter 5, I believe. Yeah, Acts 5.41. After the apostles were flogged for being Christians by the same people who had had Jesus flogged. So, so they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Counted worthy by whom? Well, maybe by God. It may be that it's saying that God trusted them with this trial. He counted them worthy to bear this cross and to be like Jesus in this respect. But in one respect, the council that flogged them counted them worthy to suffer shame. They gave them the compliment of saying, we hate you because you're like Jesus. We hate him. Well, that comes from you. That's a compliment. Because hatred from people who hate Jesus means that I must be being how I want to be, like Jesus. The things about him they hate, they seem to, uh, hopefully they see in me too and hate me. But I'm not looking for hatred from people in general. Ne neither was Jesus. Jesus wasn't out there looking to make people hate him. He was just being light, the light of the world. And some people hate the light and love darkness. So... For that reason, many hated him. And if we are light in the world, then too, uh, they should hate us, those who hate him. In verse 22, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they say, now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. Now, in other words, if they had no light, if I hadn't spoken to them, if I hadn't done these miracles for them, if they had not had such an exhibition of what is true, then their remaining in darkness would not be their fault. They could hardly be held responsible for not knowing the truth if the truth had not come and knocked on the door and faced them in my words and in my works. But it has. Therefore, they're responsible. It's very similar to what Jesus said to the Pharisees back in chapter 9 after he healed the blind man at the very end of chapter 9, verse 41. He said, it says, Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. If you were really blind and really had no light, well, you wouldn't be responsible. You wouldn't, God wouldn't count you to having sin. Again, the Bible teaches, and John teaches this very clearly, mostly, that the condemnation comes not because people are 
in the dark, but because they were given light. This is the condemnation, he said in John 3, that light has come into the world. That's the condemnation, that light came to them, and they loved the darkness rather than light. The condemnation isn't that they never heard the gospel. The condemnation is that they heard it and hated it. That's what he's pointing out. They would have no sin if they'd really never heard it. Now, that doesn't mean they, that they would have been perfect, sinless individuals. It just means that God would not have counted sin against them. He would not have counted them as worthy of condemnation if they had been in total ignorance, if he had never spoken to them or shown them anything. But it has happened, he says in verse 25, that this word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. This statement, they hated me without a cause, is found twice in the Psalms. It's in uh, Psalm 35, 19. And it's also in Psalm 69, 4. But Psalm 69 is a psalm that is used frequently in the New Testament as a source of messianic prophecy, so he may have that particular psalm in mind, uh, 69, 4. They hated me without a cause. But when the Helper comes, or the Paraclete, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me, and you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Now, they would, the apostles would be special witnesses because they had been with him from the beginning. He selected them to be his spokespersons because they had seen it all from the beginning. They'd been with him from the time of John the Baptist. And uh, he says, therefore, you will be my witnesses. And the Holy Spirit, who is coming, will bear witness also. So you won't be witnessing alone. You'll have the power of the Holy Spirit and the conviction of the Spirit backing up what you're saying so people will hear in your witness. They'll also hear the witness of the Spirit in their own hearts. And so we find the apostles were primarily the witnesses, public witnesses. We sometimes get the impression maybe that every Christian in the New Testament was running around uh, as an evangelist. That's not necessarily true. Uh, the, the Bible seems to indicate that almost all the witnessing was being done by the apostles. There were some others who did so, but it was primarily something done by the, the apostles. Uh, you can see this, I think, in um, I think in chapter 4 of Acts. It's, it's in the early chapters of Acts. Oh, yeah, here it is. Acts 4, 33, it says, And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Now, this is after it's talking about the whole church life. See, in, in verse 32, it says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart, one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own. But they had all things in common, and with great power the apostles gave witness. We've got thousands of believers in the community, and they're all living like Christians among themselves, being an example corporately of an alternative society, sharing their goods with each other and doing things that show that they love one another. That's the witness of the community. And then the apostles would go out and give public verbal witness. It would appear that the primary evangelists were the apostles, and that many of the other disciples were not doing evangelism because they weren't called to be that. Not all are apostles, not all are prophets, not all are evangelists. But in Acts chapter 5, when they are on trial, the apostles, Peter answering for them, says in verse 32, Acts 5, 32, we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. So he says, we are the witnesses, and so is the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus said at the end of John chapter 15. He says, the Holy Spirit will come, he'll bear witness, and so will you. So the apostles and the Holy Spirit together bearing witness, it agrees with what Jesus told them in Matthew chapter 10, when he told them that they'd be delivered up and to stand before uh, synagogues and councils, uh, they'd be having to give witness to Jesus before, in hostile situations. You know, in John 15, the situation of bearing witness is there in the world hating you. In Matthew 10, the same kind of context. Matthew 10, beginning verse 17, it says, Beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues, and you'll be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, verse 19, do not worry about how, you, uh, how or what you should speak. 
for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. So as they are called upon to bear testimony in a hostile situation, they don't have to worry about whether they'll be articulate or whether they'll think of the right things to say or they'll be, you know, provide a good defense for themselves. He says it won't be you. It'll be the spirit of your Father in you bearing testimony through you. So, again, the gospel is to be preached through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The apostles were particularly uh, commissioned with that task, and he promised them that when the Holy Spirit comes to you, he'll bear witness, and you'll bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning. And so ends chapter 15, but the... The discourse continues on into the next chapter.